I am the most reluctant politician you've ever seen because of that. Because I, I have a little business um, that, uh, that is involved in investment and economic development in, in Te Ao Māori, in the Māori sector. I've had a number of corporate roles throughout my time in contracts. And my wife and I, we have a little ministry where we, um, and this is some of our, minister, our fellowship whānau turning up tonight, um, and we look after this small flock of people and we share biblical times and fellowship times together. But my wife and I have also looked after homeless people on the streets of Tamaki Makoto, which is a major problem down there. And they are an abandoned people. And so we try and clothe them and feed them in winter. But this, that's all completely on hold while I do this. I'm also a, a former international guitar player. And that's completely, you know, been let go of because this, what we're doing today, and we're going to talk about that in a second, is so very, very important. What I just want to say is that I'm just like you, nothing different. I'm not a Scientologist, I'm not a Chinese communist agent, I'm not a top secretly funded businessman. I'm not a United Nations secret agent. I'm not a Maori separatist. I'm not a white supremacist. Can you believe that? I got accused of being a white supremacist today. <laughs> By a Maori academic who I went to New York with, who um, who thinks that this movement is about race. How misinformed is she? And I feel sorry for her because this involves all of us. I am a Christian first, and then I'm everything else after that. We're all God's children, and we need each other to fight for our rights and the democracies and the New Zealand that we've all grown up with and that we love and we care, care deeply about. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, awesome. that's the central part of my message, is that we need to come together. But I'm concerned exactly like you are about what's happening. I want to get into the core of the message. My message is simple. We have a, we have a hostile government down in Wellington right now. This hostile government is a communist government, led by a communist politician, one Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Who is Jacinda Ardern? Let's delve into her, her history. She's been a, parliament, a, a politician since she was a teenager virtually. She started to get groomed to be a professional politician. She starts off with, yes, she starts off as an intern with who? Alan Clark. Who is Alan Clark? Former New Zealand Prime Minister, but she is the globalist globalist. And she, is, she got to number three in the United Nations. And I met Helen at her office at the United Nations Development Program headquarters in New York. Very interesting lady. Very strange lady, but a very interesting lady. You do not become number three in the United Nations if you're not fully complicit to, you, to the United Nations agenda. You don't get there unless you are. Now, she is the matriarch of globalism. And she has interned Jacinda Ardern, who from there then goes to the United Kingdom to work for who? Tony Blair, a great war criminal. She then goes from there, comes back to Aotearoa, becomes a professional politician. What does she do? She probably, probably gets elected the president of the International Youth Socialist Movement in 2009. Now, a lot of people have said to me, Billy, why do you say that about the International Youth Socialist Movement? They're a great organisation. They do great things for young people. Well, that's great if you want your young people to grow up to be tyrannical communists. And that's the truth of it, because when you go through the list of people that have been presidents and high up in this youth socialist organisation, they are either high up in the United Nations, they're either high up in the United Nations Development Programme, high up in governments, or in our case, they're a Prime Minister. And when you see a 2009 event that she is the keynote speaker at, as president of this organisation, she is using all of the terminology and the description of the social programs that she and that organisation want to see rolled out on behalf of the United Nations across the world. In no less than seven minutes, she uses the term comrade 15 times to describe herself and to describe her colleagues in this communist organisation. But what we do want to take a step back to do is to examine how we got to where we are today. Number one, it's through the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to make it really clear right now, I don't doubt for once that the virus is real. I've done all my study, I've seen patents, 
with similar viruses and research, funding from the, from the Bill Gates Foundation for it. I know it's real. Judy Michaelowitz, Dr. Judy Michaelowitz says it's real. Other people said it's real. I believe it's real. I, I've got no problem with that. But what I do have a problem is, with is the way that this virus crisis, that it's so called, is being used to destroy our rights and freedoms, destroy economies, lives, businesses, marriages, you name it, it's destroying it. And it started with Dr. Neil Ferguson of the Imperial College in the UK. And this doctor, who's well known for making outrageous claims that don't come true, he stood up twice before him and, and totally panicked the British population saying that viruses and diseases had entered the UK and hundreds of thousands of people were going to die, and of course they didn't. He stands up and after COVID-19 is announced and says to the world, this is the greatest epidemic to hit the world since the 1918 Spanish flu, which left 50 million people dead. It did leave 50 million people dead. That's not, that's not conjecture, that's what happened. And he said that this virus, unless confronted by the, by, the, by the global family, would experience a similar result. So he panics the entire British population, panics the entire world, and says if we don't all lock down, practice social distancing, the planet was doomed. And that the virus was 3 to 6% lethal. That's massive. That's, that's this part of the room. If we were to get it here, that's this part of the room virtually gone. That's how lethal that is. Well, the problem is, is that three weeks later after making these claims, he had to stand up and say to the world, look, I'm very, very sorry. I admit I got it completely wrong. My modelings and projections were completely off. It's way off. It's not hundreds of thousands. It's not millions. It's going to be 30,000 people dead in Britain at the hands of this virus, which is less than the annual flu figure in, in Britain. But the problem with that is that what happens? Tony Fauci, who's Tony Fauci? Glad you asked. <coughs> Dr. Anthony Fauci is President Trump's civilian head of the COVID-19 response team in the United States. And he appears on the scene, and what does he do? He says to the world, Dr. Ferguson is completely right. We've got a lockdown, we've got a lockdown now, we've got a lockdown all of the states. This is the worst thing that's happened since the 1918 Spanish flu. We need to lock down and we need to lock down now. Mr. President. So that's exactly what happens. Then it enters Dr. Bill Gates. Oh, sorry, he's not a doctor, is he? Sorry about that. My mistake. And Bill Gates enters the room and goes, I agree with all these great doctors like Tony Fauci. I agree that this is the worst thing since the 1918 Spanish flu. This is an epidemic of all, of epic proportions. And we need to lock down, we need to deal with it. And we need to vaccinate all men, women, and children on God's earth. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do you guys a solid. I'm going to develop a vaccine. And I'm going to vaccinate every man, woman, and child on God's earth. And what a great guy I am. But what he forgets to say is that about 18 months earlier, he'd been caught out on a TV interview. When someone said to him, a wily journalist asked him, Mr. Gates, why do you invest so heavily in the vaccine industry? And he said, well, you know what? For every $1 that I invest in the vaccine industry, I get a $20 return. Every $1. So what do you get if you, if you uh, invest $500 million into vaccine programs like he does all the time? You get 20 times that back. So he, but the thing that's interesting, he didn't say, I'm doing it to help people, I'm doing it to save lives, I'm doing it to prevent disease, I'm doing it for us. He said, no, I get a $20 return for every $1 that I, that I bang out into investment in this sector. Going back to Tony Fauci, doesn't Fauci sound like a cheese? He does, doesn't it? I worked it out the other day. Tony Fauci enters the scene again, and he says, yes, Bill Gates is a great guy, we need to do the Bill Gates program. But he does not mention a major conflict of interest, which is, number one, he sits as what? An executive board member for whom? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's in business with Bill Gates. And what he doesn't mention 
is that Bill Gates funds coronavirus research and vaccine development for coronaviruses. And what he doesn't mention is that, that Bill Gates funds institutes like the Purewhite Institute in the United Kingdom to do what? <coughs> to create and develop vaccines, and not only vaccines, but the viruses for coronavirus research, the Purewhite Institute UK. And how do I know this? Because I've looked up, found the patents in the UK patent office, found the grants from the Melinda, and, uh, from the Melinda Gates Foundation, and corroborated that. But what Fauci doesn't mention, which is very critical here, is that in his role as the director of the National Institute of Health, is that under his watch, he worked with a Chinese scientist at the where? At the Fort Detrick Bioweapons Lab in North Carolina. Working on what? You guessed it, coronaviruses. And how to take a corona novel, novel bat virus and turn it into a human trans transportation virus so that it can make a viable leap into a human body. And who blew the whistle on that? Again, Dr. Judy Mikovits, who's now, whose life, very life right now is threatened. Her career is over. She's in serious trouble. She lives on a boat because she doesn't want anyone to find her. That's how serious a situation she's in now for blowing the whistle. So Fauci mentions none of this, but he also doesn't mention that at a time when President Trump had closed down all investment and partnership programs of foreign national scientists, <laughs> that Tony Fauci just this Chinese scientist, 3.7 million US dollars of the taxpayer money. She completes her research successfully and then goes to Wuhan, and guess what? Suddenly, there's a virus, a coronavirus, released on the population from the local Chinese bat takeaway. So that's the backdrop, we know all this. Well, what does that mean in our own situation? What does that mean in our own situation? It means this. It means that we now have Dr. Ashley Bloomfield turn up and he says, hey everybody, this is terrible. But who is Dr. Ashley Bloomfield? Well, in 2010 to 2011, he, served, he served as a doctor for the who? You guessed it, literally, the World Health Organization. And who are the World Health Organization? They are a sub-specialist agency of the United Nations. Be clear in your mind, finally, that when you say WHO, you are saying United Nations. Be very clear on that. They are not a separate organisation. They've got another name, but they are as much as the United Nations are as the UNDP. They are the United Nations. And who, run, who is running the, the, the WHO? Tedros. And Tedros is a communist. How do we know that? Because he was the former leader. He was the former leader of the Atreian Liberation People's Army in Ethiopia. He was a very much a senior person in that. And during the civil war that happened where his communist junta took over the government, a lot of people got very, very sick with cholera and he let them die. He could have treated them, but he let them die. That's who became the Director General of the WHO. He's a communist, nothing sure of it. Then Bloomfield turns up in New Zealand and he says, this is the worst thing since sliced bread. Fauci is right, Tedros is right, Dr. Neil Ferguson is right. But Dr. Neil Ferguson family had already said that all the modelling was false, was incorrect. But once the WHO had announced it, Bloomfield picks it up and runs with it and pushes it harder and harder. They went hard and faster, right? But not the way that we think. They went hard and fast, pushing COVID-19 fear death, COVID-19 fear death, COVID-19 fear death. For, a, for what? What we now know, absolutely across the world, by all the head scientists and research scientists that stand up and tell us, it's nothing more than a flu virus. It's nothing more than that in terms of mortality. But what happened about a year ago in New York, at a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation event, yes, Bill and Melinda Gates, our Prime Minister stood on a, on, a, on a stage with a pulpit and she said in front of a packed audience that she was going to commit New Zealand beyond any other country on God's earth to fully implementing and entrenching Agenda 2030 and agenda, by doing that, Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. She said it. She, has it, have you guys seen that? Yeah. Yep. 
this is this is not this is not conspiracy language. This is fact. She stood there and said that these United Nations programs would be fully implemented in our country. But the problem with that, fellow New Zealanders, is this: is that if fully implemented, they will destroy the New Zealand that we love, that we hold dear, that we hold sacred. How so? Because Agenda 21 is the opening program which leads to the outcome of full extension into Agenda 2030. Agenda 21, Sustainable Development, is a United Nations program which was signed off in 1992 at the Rio Summit. That was the year that the term Gaia, or Earth Goddess, first hit the planetary scene. And Agenda 21 is not a conspiracy, it is a fact. You can Google it, but when you go to un.org and you find Agenda 21, you'll see it all written up there, it looks beautiful. Sustainable development, you know, ending poverty, social justice, social equity, sustainable this, sustainable that. But the problem is when you drill right into the terminology and you go to other source, sources for references about how to interpret the terminology, you might as well write all that out and, and, put, and put where it says sustainable, put control. Control, control, control. And the global leaders around the world that want to see this brought in are the same global leaders that needed a mechanism to bring these programs in, to collect economies around the world, to make us all dependent on foreign lending through the United Nations systems, through the IMF and the World Bank. But to do this, they needed a mechanism to do that. It walks COVID-19, thank you very much. These are no longer conspiratorial things to say because when you line up all the chain of evidence and connect the dots, it's plain as, plain as day to see. There's nothing conjectural about it. You can do your research, find it. I'm not a big smart guy, I'm just a thinking guy and I worked it all out. It's easy to do. So that's why we are now where we are today, where we have the COVID-19 lockdown for a second time, Fano. That's going to destroy our country. We said it six weeks ago. We said that this was coming. We were told we were alarmists. And here it is. Jacinda Ardern has no sympathy. She has no empathy. She has no concern to the frivolous spending that she's putting out there and putting these babies and their children into debt. She has no problem destroying democracy. She has no problem destroying the New Zealand Bill of Rights, and we'll go into these things in a minute. <coughs> Believe you me, our Prime Minister is a cold-blooded communist leader. And I take no pleasure in saying this. She is as much as that as I am standing in front of you right now as a free-thinking New Zealander. But this program, Agenda 21, in case you didn't know about it, what is Agenda 21? It is a centralisation of everything that you need to live as a free human being on this planet. It controls what you eat, controls what you're allowed to grow, it controls what you want to do with your water, how you're allowed to collect it or not. It controls what you can do with your land. How many of you are farmers here? I've got bad news for you because Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 is aimed right at you guys right now. And that's why this government is so hostile towards the agri sector. It controls your medical sovereignty because they don't want you to be healthy. They want you to use their medical options, which are pharmaceutical options. They want to repurpose your land so that it becomes not an agricultural outlook, but it becomes what they call underneath this plan, special designated areas, sustainable development areas. And they become human exclusive zones where we're not allowed to go there unless you want to there 1% elite and you get your little approval. But what they want to do with that is they want to control all the flow of food production and harvest. So we eat what they give us. So what does that mean? That means collapsing the generations of farming families that have made their livelihoods out of producing beef, lamb, food, milk, you name it. They want to, they want to take it all. But with that, guys, it gets worse, I'm sorry to say. They then want to take people that live in provincial country environments and they want to put us all in high-rise cities where they will 
mandatorily vaccinate you. You will not have a choice because if you're all living in the city, you're going to be part of the herd. And if you want to be a part of the herd, you've got to be vaccinated. Sorry, whether you like it or not. They will have us in a highly technocratic society where they will watch at us, watch everything we do with our money, with who we know, where we go, what we do, what we say, what we think through the 5G system, and they will radiate us all to death for the luxury of it. That's Agenda 21. But there's another core to it as well, because at the very core of all of this is spirituality, and they want to control that as well. Because I can tell you right now that this is not conjecture. When you go into the heart of study around the United Nations, they are Luciferian to the core. And I don't say that very often. I say that because I'm with a bunch of uh, my buddies here that, that have the same faith that I do. But I've studied it inside out. I know that they are Luciferian. I've seen the documentation. I've seen the programs. I've seen the anecdotal rhetoric. They are Luciferians that run the United Nations and they want this, this program to be rolled out. And Jacinda Ardern said it publicly. She wants to make New Zealand the test case for the rest of the world. But I've got news for you, Jacinda. Drop there. Yeah. So we've got a decision to make. We are seeing our society being destroyed through the, through the COVID-19 pandemic. I saw Bloomfield last night and, and today on TV. And I can't even stand looking at him. I don't believe him for a second. No, I'm very, very serious. I don't trust him. He doesn't look right to me. Far be it for me to judge any other human soul. But he doesn't look right to me at all. Jacinda doesn't. Does she look right to you? No. She doesn't really, no. eh? If we, if we be real about it. But more than anything, family, I was with a business owner three days ago in Whangarei. This lady was on the front page of the Northern Advocate about a week ago. And this lady, her business is about to go down the tubes. The first lockdown destroyed her business. She, she, got a, she got a mortgage to keep it afloat. She got a second mortgage to trade her out of it. And she said to me the other day, Billy, I'm so scared that there's going to be another lockdown. And I said to her, sis, I'm sorry, there's one coming. She says, no, 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 but, the, you know, I'm hoping that it won't come. And I said, I'm sorry, sis, I know it's coming. It's coming, coming very soon. And then the next day, bang, it gets announced. I'll be to go and see you today. And she'd gone to work, and she was so upset, she became unwell and left to go home. She's going to lose her home, she's going to have a big bill, and for what? And for what? And for what? So right now, we've got a, we've got a, um, we've got a government that has introduced the COVID-19 health response bill. What is this bill? In case you didn't know, let's do a quick summary of it. This is a bill that authorises people without a warrant, who aren't policemen, to go into your workplace, go onto your land, and they can take you, they can take you, they can take you, they can take you and your babies and your children away and perform a medical examination on you. And there's no recourse, you gotta go. If you are a policeman, you are, you are allowed to go into someone's marae or someone's house and take you and your children away without a warrant for a medical examination. When I first started saying that, I said it was a medical procedure, and I had a smart armchair specialist um, say to me, well, Billy, I'm sorry, the section, um, section 20 says, um, says that it's a medical examination, not a procedure. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but if you want to talk about a medical procedure or an, versus an examination, I said, well, respectfully, wake up. I said, I'm first aid trained, and I can tell you that if a six inch COVID-19 swab like this is stuck way up your nasal passage, so far it goes to the back of your throat and scrapes the top of your tonsils, I'd pretty much call that a medical procedure, wouldn't you? I would too, so let's not, let's not major on the minors. She was being smart, but so was I, because that's a medical procedure. I don't care what you call it. So that's what they can do, but it, go, it gets worse because in July, they announced that they're going to ha hand over the quarantine management of COVID-19 to the army, to the military. And I remember when, it, when this came out, I did a live statement from, um, from the Beehive and I said, this is disgusting, they're going to militarise all the operations to do with it. People said, you're crazy. I said, yep, this is going to be military law, it's under armed forces law. Why? Because a military commander 
has taken control of this issue and he's going to have jurisdiction to enforce, to enforce uh, the, the law on a civilian population. And because he's under military law, that naturally means he's operating under military law. And in times of warfare and in times of crisis, when that happens, the military commander, civilian law is subject to military law. I can't explain it any, any better than that. But how do I know this? Well, before I go there, I had another armchair specialist get in touch with me and say, but Billy, you can't do that under Section 20. It's famous Section 20 again. And I said, well, you did, you did in fact do in two things, love. And she, and she was a very clever lady, but she had provision two things. Number one, 18 years ago, I was at Trentham Army Camp um, studying military police law because I was on a tour of duty with what the military police unit headquarters in Trentham, studying that very thing. And it said very clearly in the handbook I was studying that in times of crisis and warfare, that when, when military commanders are given authority within civilian populations, it's under military law, period, period. But I said they were going to operationalise, and they have done. Cabinet released three weeks ago the plan that when they go into another lockdown, they may have 85 checkpoints across New Zealand, and they will be manned by both civilian police and military personnel. That's, op that's militarisation operationally. Verbatim. That's it. You can't get much plainer than that. But what they what they didn't declare fully and properly, which I have the documents for in here, is that they were going to then use military staff to do door to door knocking and information gathering, which is what <coughs> testing. Testing. I would never have dreamed of that when I was in the army that that was going to happen. Never in a million years would I thought we would be given permission walk around civilian streets. They haven't said whether they're armed or not. I say, I would, I'd say they're going to be. Because you know why I say that? Because they know that there's going to be some staunch farmers and people out there that are not going to tolerate these people coming on to their land to vaccinate them or force a medical procedure on them. I don't believe that for a second. I hope I'm wrong, guys. I, with, all my, with all my heart, I pray that I'm wrong on that point because there will be bloodshed and I advocate peaceful protest in every way. Yeah. So we know that they have militarised the operation. They want to bring in this law that's going to now destroy the economy. It's the killer blow. The thing I've been worried about though is if they use this COVID lockdown, the second, to control the elections. It's been a deep concern of mine. A deep, deep concern of mine. So, Fano, we are at the, uh, we are standing on the edge of a cliff, at the end, end of the, of the edge of a cliff, and we all have to make our minds up whether we're going to go along with the program or not, peacefully. I want to advocate that, that you have started a movement like no other ever seen in New Zealand political history. The movement that I'm talking about is the New Zealand Public Party movement. Yeah, yeah. And what happened was eight yeah. weeks ago, nine weeks ago, I sat there on a Sunday after an avalanche of people asked me to do this, to stand up and run for parliament to defend our country. After saying no for weeks, I turned around and said, I'm gonna have to do this. My wife said, You do it, you're in trouble. <laughs> she did, she said no, because our faith tells us that we don't want to do, we don't want to be involved in politics. But I said to my wife, if I don't do, do this, I'm not going to be able to look myself in the mirror in the same way ever again. I'm not the man I thought I was. I had to take a stand. So on the Sunday, I said yes. On the Monday, I came, I came up with a name, the New Zealand Public Party. On the Tuesday, we developed a logo. On the, we decided on the Tuesday we'd have a launch on the Thursday. On the Wednesday, we confirmed the venue. On the Thursday, we launched. <laughs> And you know what? It was launched in this big, big venue um, down at the Akarana Yacht Club on Tamaki Drive. And I walked in, I went, oh my gosh, the size of the massive venue. Massive venue. Like, oh, no. And I remember saying to the broadcast, OK, Fano, if you want me to do this, prove to me it's real. Because if you don't tune up tonight, I'm going home back to Patola. And you know what? I, I stood at the back before it was time for me to go out and speak. And I was finishing my, well actually I was starting my speech. And I walked out and it was chocker, packed, 
couldn't believe it. And it told me that this movement that I believed that God had his hand on was a true movement and that it was going to happen. Just some fun facts is number one, in eight weeks only, we have, we have almost 7,000 members. 7,000 members. Normally, normally, Whanau, when a new political party starts, you, ha you need 550 registered members to be a party. It's the way it is, electoral rules. And it can, take, it can take political parties weeks, months, if not a year or so, to get your 550 sign-ups. We did it in less than two days. Awesome, yeah. We did it in less than two days. Thank you. We did it in less than two days. We average anywhere between 50 to 200 new sign-ups a day. Um, we've had almost 2 million people engage in the message. Since yesterday, and here's a little secret for you, since yesterday when it was announced that the second lockdown has come on the very date almost that we said it would, the second week of August, our ratings and the memberships and the people now wanting to be involved in the movement has gone like this. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Thank you. But this movement, it's not my movement alone. It's your movement, it's our movement, it's all everyone's movement. This is not this is not a Billy Tekahika movement. I'm the I'm the servant of the movement. I'm a servant for you. I'm a servant for I believe in hope for, for God to do the right thing for all New Zealanders, to get us into Parliament, to, to defend us. What do we stand for? Number one, democracy. Up there, democracy. If we don't have democracy, whānau, we don't have anything. If we don't have democracy and constitutional protections, we're going to have tyrannical governments again that are going to try and do this nonsense to us. So we need to defend our democracy. Without democracy, you don't have outdoors. An outdoors party. You don't have monetary reform, social credit. You don't have conservative lifestyles, new conservatives. And it astounds me that these so-called political parties, minor parties as they are, no wonder they're minor, because they major on the minor issues that mean absolutely nothing if you don't have democracy as number one. And it astounds me finally that these foolish people are after the smidgen of the vote instead of concentrating and getting into parliament to rescue the majority. I'm over them, and I'm angry with them because my colleague and I, Jamie Lee Ross, we are in touch with them every few days, saying to them, "Let's come on, guys, let's do this together and go into the parliament and rescue our country." <coughs> and they say everything you want to hear under the sun as an excuse not to do it. Don't believe a word of it, because if we don't have democracy as number one, nothing else matters. Number two, there. Government integrity and accountability. I'm sick of having liars in the House of Representatives. I say this now to you. I will never lie to you, but I will never lie for you to get what you want. I'll never do that game. Oh, yeah. I'll and integrity in the House of Representatives, and it's, I don't believe it's there anymore. I believe that good people go in, but unless you're anchored, anchored, you're going to get anchored in God for me. You're going to be swept along the tide. And that's why I don't like politicians. Why? Because the, we, they change the principles that they stand on to suit what they think they're going to get the voters into. I can't do that. I won't do that. <clears throat> but I'm not here to sell you policies. These things here are what you've all told me you want fought for. Government integrity and accountability and one that works for the people, not trying to get the people to work for it. Number three, public safety. And that means everything underneath that, which is this business and economic and fiscal expertise. Right now, we need real people that have been in business, made money, lost money, made money again, have, have had a few bruises and scrapes in life, that know what it's like to lose, but they know what it takes to win. We need real people in there to make um, business decisions and how we can get our economy kick-started again and out of the debt. Because one of the things that's absolutely clear is that this government is getting us into huge debt that they have no idea how they're going to pay it back. Yeah. And so when she stands there on the on the, on the the lectern that she had last night saying, guess what, New Zealand, don't worry about the second lockdown, we'll just give you money, it's your money, my money, and your grandchildren's money she's given away as Santa Claus. 
Sorry, Jacinda Ardern, we're not going to fall for that. So we need yeah. economics experts who can work with real business people to get our trade going, to get our trade relationships underway again. Environmental sovereignty, let's get rid of 1080 yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that includes, that includes fluoride in our water systems. Yeah. <laughs> There is no reason why we should have fluoride in our water. Leading orthodontists say there is no benefit in our water for children's teeth, anyone's teeth. Let's get rid of it. Treat your way, Tangi, and here you go again. I had, this is the bizarre thing I saw on, online today. I had the one party, so-called Christian people that want to legislate faith, which is against biblical principles right now, I'll tell you. The Treaty of Waitangi is a document that all New Zealanders can now adopt. Why do I say this? Why do I say this? Here's a little bit of history for you, fun facts. I've got a, I've got a hardcore Māori dad into mana motahaki Māori, tino ranga tinatanga, kuhui rei sovereignty, love all that. I've got a beautiful French-Irish um, mother, <coughs> lovely lady. But when I was growing up, talking about the treaty to my Pākehā whānau, they're like, oh, I'm not talking about that Māori crap. <laughs> Talking to my Māori whānau about it, <laughs> parties don't get it. <laughs> but I, I feel in my heart of hearts that we've come a long way together as a family. I believe that. We've, this country has matured leaps and bounds even in my lifetime. We realise now, ko whāne ko tahi tātou, we're one family. Te rongi te rongi te moa a i hukaiti, under the Lord's name. You know, I believe that in my whole heart. But what I have seen in my study of the treaty, if we're talking about deals with the United Nations, well, I've got tough luck for you again, Jacinda Ardern and your, your team, because the Treaty of Waitangi is a deal between the indigenous <coughs> peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and who? The Crown, not the United Nations. And now yes. all New Zealanders can claim that right of protection under us, because we are a whanau. That doesn't diminish Māori. It underlines our important position of kaitiaki whenua, guardians of this land. And this treaty is with the Crown, not with the United Nations. Right. And that's the only recourse document out of 12 founding documents we have. And when the new Conservatives turn up and say they want to get rid of the treaty, I always go, hmm, that's a bit weird. It's a bit strange. Religious freedom, why religious freedom? Now I believe that when Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, no one can go to the Father but by him, I believe he spoke the truth in verity. But I will defend a Sikh. I was at a Sikh temple the other day. I will defend a Jewish man, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, to believe what they want to believe, because anything less than that is spiritual rape. And religious... Decision making, religious freedom is a God given right. It's not up for a God government to, to permit or tolerate. It's God given. So I want to ensure that religious freedom is always a part of the government that I'm a part of. That's so important. Pearl Public Health and Sovereignty. This is a big one right now. Because what do they want to do? They want to mand make mandatory, mandatory, mandatory vaccination on you, our babies, our children, our grandchildren. This is where it's going, Father. This, all of this is about heading towards a vaccination program that we're going to have no recourse out of. Well, I'm sorry, Jacinda. Again, bad news for you. Bad news for you. Because I tell you what, we are not going to tolerate the idea of our babies being forced vaccinated. This is about choice, people. Whānau, this is, I'm, I can honestly say that were proven vaccines that are safe, which none have been guaranteed that. I'm not anti-vax, I'm pro-choice. I am pro-choice. You don't want it? Katie Poi, great. You want it? Katie Poi, great, dumb. Awesome. But your choice. Awesome. But, yeah. You know, but your choice, Fano. And, and, and I say that to give us some, you know, some comic relief here. But it's, it's about choice. So, but what I do want to do is that I want to have a, a, a good medical program that's government supported that says to people, guess what everybody, 
true human health is not at the end alone of a needle or the swallowing of a pill. It's about immune system building up. It's about diet. It's about plenty of water. It's about sunshine. It's about good vitamin um, um, dietary supplements. It's about going to Providence and having your lunches at the cafe down in Dugaville, you know, and having juices and stuff like that. Because what we don't want to believe is the lie that only pharmaceutical um, options are, are the only way to go. No, that's not that's not fact. And I'm not saying that you know that we use you know kooky things as our, as natural health options. No, I'm talking about the proven things that we know that work for people and bringing that up to the same level of recognition as pharmaceutical medicines. Immigration reform, we need that. Why? Because I've met some fantastic new Kiwis, or I call them new Kiwis, or new New Zealanders, whichever way you want to go, that are genuinely wanting to contribute to New Zealand, both from a cultural perspective, <coughs> from a business perspective, and from a whānau tanga perspective as well. But you know what? They get shunned as well. You know, they get shunned and made to feel poorly. And I'm not talking about the, about the people from overseas that come in, they get all creepy and they want to stay in their own little little boxes and not associate with all of us. I'm talking about the real ones that come in and they're like, they're like, hey, here, want to engage, you know, want to go into business and want to do the right thing. You know, oh, we, want to, we want to set up an immigration system that's good. And you know what? I'll tell you something. I've met a man called Mr. Jogga Singh. Mr. Jogga Singh. Who the heck is Mr. Jogga Singh? He's a great Indian man, been here for 20 years. He's a Kiwi. He's a New Zealand citizen. And he has written a, an awesome immigration policy. He's written one that I looked at and went, ooh, that's tough. Went, ooh, that's tough. But the other side of that is that he does have the other side of it. It's also, he has a fair, uh, he has a f fair merits point system where people want to live here, they've got to go for five years, earn their merit points of good behaviour, then they get a permanent residency. Then they, after a few more years, they can become a permanent resident. Then a few, f few more years after that, they can be a citizen. Then they can invite their families over. But done in a fair way. And we need that because we're a fair nation, or we should be. Monetary reform. Just want to touch on this quickly. Our monetary system is corrupt inside out. Nothing more clear in the same than that. And we need to put experts in it in the government that are going to unpack the monetary system because it's 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 not right. I'm not going to go into the detail. But those of you that know what fractional reserve banking is. How many of you know about fractional reserve banking? Oh, there's a few kids like me here. Fantastic. Fractional reserve banking is dishonest, and the entire system is based on it. To give you a little hint about what it is, um, when banks overseas, like IMF and all these other big banks, lend money, they only need 10% of the, of the actual value of what they lend in their vault. 10%. Think about that. 10%. So when they go and lend New Zealand $110 billion, they've got $10 billion back, back in the jar, back in the vault. And they just digitise the rest of it and monetise it. <coughs> but what happens is you get this piece of paper, which is a, which is a, which is a let's say it's a $10 note, $100 note, and it's worth nothing but the paper it's written on. That's fractional, that's fractional reserve banking, so we need to look at that. Last line down here, defence. Yes, we need good defence. But the defence investment level needs to be relative to the threat that we face. And right now this government's trying to get us into more debt with another billion odd dollars spent on defence. Why? They can't justify it. I believe that the young men and women and the men and women of the services, armed forces, are fantastic people. They need to have the best gear to work with. But, but train them up in the best gear and invest in the type of equipment beyond that that's relative to the threat. So that's sensible investment based on a good strategic plan, tactical plan. International relationships and trade, man, do I really want to unpack this? I really want to go in to Parliament and I want to unpack all of the deals that any of the crooked governments have ever signed us up to. I didn't like John Key. I found my old Facebook posts a few weeks ago with me giving John Key a good hard time during the last government. He was doing the same things as Jacinda, but in a different way. Same concept, different execution style. But I will unpack these deals because did you know that New Zealand has signed up to international agreements that I can't find out information about? I'm not allowed to, you're not allowed to. Did you know that? 
It's secret, top secret. Even though you pay their wages, that's top secret. That's not right. Trade. Who does dairy? Does anyone do dairy here? Dairy, dairy farming? Okay, cool. Well, that's a, I'll tell you what, I've been speaking to a lot of dairy farmers late, lately, and I, I'll tell you what, my heart goes out to you guys. But anyway, I want to find out why some of these trade agreements, these free trade agreements that we're signing up to, why do we need to sell our sovereignty to be in them? Old Teodoro, New Zealand, we are the bread basket of the planet. Everybody wants our milk, our butter, our cheese, yeah, our yeah, meat, yeah. our land, our yeah. beef, our fish, our mussels, our oysters, our yeah. powers, you name it, goes on and on and on. Why do we need why do we need to enter trade deals yeah. where we sell one and gotta buy two? And we've got to give up our sovereignty. Why? Because you have foolish people doing strange deals for whatever reason. Compromise. Behind the compromising, that's right. They're compromising behind the scenes, and I want to find out why and how. Good one. The, the last one here, national in, in, independence. Why national independence being the last, the foundational one on the bottom? Because to, in order to have democracy, Fano, you have to understand we need our national independence. Because if we are in debt to the IMF, if we sign up to Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, if we sign up to all these um, TPPA type agreements, we will lose our sovereignty. If we take Chinese Communist Party funding, we're going to lose our sovereignty. And that's what they're doing to us right now. Both National and Labour have received communist Chinese Communist Party funding. Can you believe that? No wonder everything's been sold to China. This is why. Because, you know, they turn up, give the government some, give the Labour Party or the National Party some funding, hey presto, they've just bought all the, you know, they've bought the silver fern farms, let's say. Water. Water, yeah, any one of it. You know, it's, just, it's, it's astounding. When you get a multi-million dollar water company down in Christchurch paying, what is it, $500 a year for a license? And they pump out millions and millions and millions, gazillions of our water, take it to China? Sorry, we need to look at these things. But national independence is so important. If we don't have the top, you don't get the bottom. If you don't have the bottom, you can't have the top, and you certainly don't get the things in the middle. Just to close off, guys. Awesome. So some of the things that we want to do immediately, and we've got loads of policies coming. Man, we're like little chipmunks. We've had to take a couple of days off while we do deal with this current lockdown crisis. This is serious, folks, and I'm going to close off with that. So my folk. But number one, we're going to repeal the COVID-19 health response bill. We've got to do it. Billy, <laughs> just before you close off, I think you've missed a little bit of a point which I'm really disappointed about. Yeah. And it's to do with Ashley Bloomfield, because I don't think you've given him enough credit. Um, he mentioned that the test that you take with that little swab is uh, similar to a rugby tackle. And I just wondered if we thought what Ashley Bloomfield would look like if he was tackled by Artie Sabir. <laughs> good question, good question. I see where you're coming from. Yes, it would be nice to see how you deal with a good tackle, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to take But number one, we've got to get rid of it because they are going to use that to destroy our country. Nothing better. <coughs> I'll, I'll give you a hint. The reason why they want to want to destroy our economy through this is because they're, they're going to need to borrow more money. And if they collapse businesses, this is the chain. This is how it works. You collapse my business, who do I become reliant on? The state. If they need to give money and they run out of money, who do they need to rely on? The UN. The UN and foreign funders. Exactly. That's how it works. And if they can do that. They've got you. That's how they did it to Bolivia, they've done it to countries all around the world where they do things and they get them into so much debt the poor countries can't get themselves out of it, then they swoop in and they take over. That's how they do it. That's their modus operandi. Formally end also the influence of the Chinese Communist Party New Zealand affairs. We need to do this. You don't realise how important this is. Yes. It's yes. super important. We need to also, we need to support true economic recovery. We need to do it through the business sector. Economic development 
is the end state. Good business is the pathway that gets you to economic development. And the bureaucrats and the career polit politicians don't know this. They keep on talking about, oh, the Pro Provincial Growth Fund, economic development this, economic development that. But if they don't understand that, that the backbone to our economy is the small, medium enterprise businesses, and it's the agricultural sector, it's the export sector, it's the productivity sectors, if they don't understand that, and tourism, and get us open again, in the right way, I'm not talking about putting us at risk. I'm talking about being creative, being entrepreneurial, so that we can get foreign money into our country spending. But they don't want to do that, they want to collapse us. Because why? Because they want to collapse the middle class, drop us down, that's socialism. There's two classes in communism, the haves up the top, called the hierarchy, and the have-nots, which is everybody else, the herd. And we, they consider all of us to be the herd, by the way. And the name of the herd in communist language is proletariat. Well, you know what you can do with your proletariat, just under a dude. Okay, so we need, to get, we need to get business up and working again. We also need to repair and reinstate our traditional trading relationships with the US. The United States don't trust us. Why would they do us a solid and do a free trade agreement with us? I wouldn't, because you can't be best friends with me and be best friends with my enemy. Yeah. No. No, that's not how it works. That's called two-facedism, isn't it? Yeah. You know? So we're not like that as a country. So why should we be like that on the world stage when people, people want to be friends with the Chinese Communist Party and say no to the very country that saved our bacon during World War II? We also want to reinstate our traditional trade relationships with Great Britain and some of our trading partners in other corners of the world. China is a, is a, is a good option, but it's not the only option. So we need to get our traditional trade um, relationships going again. But lastly, New Zealand, we need to re-establish New Zealand as a place for New Zealanders. For people that come over here want to be New Zealanders, let's welcome them in. Let's make them um, welcome here so they can co contribute to our country. But let's turn New Zealand back to what it was. Let's make New Zealand great again, family. What do you yeah. say? I am the candidate for Te Tai Tukiro Māori seat for Northland. I'm disappointed in Calvin, who I've known for 15 years. Calvin Davis has done nothing in almost three years he's been here. When he became the MP for Te Tai Tukiro, I foolishly and naively thought, here we go, he's Minister of Tourism, he's number two in the Labour Party, he's going to get things done. Not one thing. Not one thing, Fano. Winston Peters, fuck a puppet to Ngāti Wai. Not one thing. Big court and all, big talk about bringing the port of Auckland, Tamaki Makoto, over to Martin Point. Nothing. Nothing. Politicians, that's why I don't like them. But to a shame, he tried, but he knew that he was pushing it uphill. He oversold it. That's what I'm not going to do to you. I will fight for all these nine items that we have here. Fight for every one of them, tooth and nail. But I'm not going to say I'm going to do this. I'm going to say we're going to go in there and we're going to rough things up. We're going to fight for these things. And if I can't do it, you'll be the first to know it. I'm not going to continue lying on it. That's what he's done. Oh, we're going to do this in the next term. Rubbish. Because you're not going to be in the next term, Charlie. You're gone. Because you know what? New Zealand First supporters across the country, and I see them, they know the game is up with Winston. He's exposed himself. Politically. He's ex he has. The game is up with him. It's up with him. So we have these Māori MPs within the House of Representatives that have been silent about this destruction and this threat to our old terror in New Zealand. They've been silent. I'm not one of those silent few because I can't be silent. Te Tai Tokiro has all the potential in the world, yet we are the back bum of Aotearoa, even though we're up in the north. The next abandoned territory is Te, te Tai Rafati in the east coast, where my people are from. After that, it's Waikato Tainui. Shame on Waikato Tainui. That's also where I fucked a papa too. And it's time that Te Tai Tokiro had an had a MP that's going to fight for them. My campaign slogan in, in, in Māori is Fa Fai Mo Te Tai Tokiro. I will fight for Te Tai Tokiro. Because I tell you what, to everyone else here, what's good for Māori Northland will be good for all of us. Yeah. Yeah.
we give that one name. Thank you. Awesome. I find boys with guys talk you I think, you know what, when I came up there sleeping last week, I was like, yeah, well, that father are going to love that one. <laughs> Cause, because, because it's shameful. We've got our people are living in tree huts, bush huts, cars. Cold garages right now with no lining in them. Station wagons, motels. Did you know that our government spends six hundred million dollars every three months on emergency housing? Six hundred million dollars. Okay, then government, just give me sixty million dollars every three months, and I'll build everyone houses up here. But not only that, Bano, and I'm talking about Pākehā Māori. Everyone that needs a home. When they build these social houses, I grew up in a state house. They were called state houses then. Not social houses, that's a good buzzword to make the government feel better. We're all being social in our houses. Great. Not quite. But no, it's not like that. The, pre the reason social houses disturb me is because they're, they're rubbish homes, they're cold, unhealthy to live in, bad for the environment, but when the people get in them, they've got no chance of ever owning them. And that's, keep, that's what keeps people in poverty. Because if you don't get on the property ownership ladder, you're going to be in poverty in all your life. I'm telling you, it's the truth of it. And I've lived it. I've watched my, my mum live in it. But I'm, I've been blessed by the Lord. I've owned properties. have a beautiful farm now. But unless you're on that property ladder and get a hand up or a hand out, you'll never get anywhere. And so my, my commitment to, to, to Tai Tōpiro, and please fill me and share this amongst the whānau, we want to get 200 families and homes in our first two. 200 families and homes in our first two. We are also, we are also going to get rid of Oranga Tamariki. Oranga Tamariki is broken. That is a dishonest organisation that is about corrupting families, breaking families, and doing things dishonestly. 72 Māori babies in the last year or so have been uplifted from their mums within hours of being born without any notice to the whānau. 72 babies. 72 babies. We need to replace that with a service that is actually a family service, not a state-run dictatorship that takes these babies and takes them away from the parents, never to be seen or again. That's disgusting. That happens in Soviet Russia, North Korea, China, it shouldn't be happening here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Yeah. So, Fano, getting excited here. Good on you, yeah. No, I'm, I, I care, yeah, it's called passion, but I care for all of us. Number one, I, the reason why I did, I've done this movement with you all is that, number one, I want to see all of you saved. There is a time coming ahead of us that each one of us need to be right with, with God. We need to have our families right. We need to be right. That's the number one thing for me, and I want to say to all of you, come and get some of these books up here, take them away and read them, because they've got some good info in there, which started me off when I, was a, when I was younger. This is a serious time we live in, but putting the faith aside, the, this is a very pragmatic time we live in, and this government is going to lock us down. I want you to know that I've received information that has told me tonight that the police are prepared to go into operations enforcing the lockdown on level four at midnight on Friday. Yeah. It's not Monday like people are saying. You need to do you need to calmly do your shopping tomorrow. Look, I hope I'm wrong, but the man that rung me is a dear friend of mine, a 20-year police veteran. He rang me up today and said, Billy, you need to know this. Orders came through saying that. Midnight Friday night, they're locking everyone down into level four and come into effect. Get yourself sorted. So get your food tomorrow. So they get the regular. Yeah, I reckon. March. Mm. It's all of us. Yeah. You know what? Okay, that's a really, really good scenario to bring up. Yeah. Got, yes, that's right. We've got to work out. Finally, we've got to be careful because I said last night that what we need to do is protest, right? And we do, but we need to be careful how we plan it. I'm planning with people across New Zealand about this because what we don't want, and they will do this, they will put plants in our peaceful protest and it will turn violent. And they've done it across the states. That's the leftist agenda. They will create chaos. And I don't want to see any of us, when we're marching with our babies, 
Well, they're little ones like this little one running over here, the one sitting over here. I don't want to see us without without Fano marching in peace. And next minute, a big smash up, big punch up happens. I don't want that at all because I know some of the people that support this movement will be carving it up, and I don't want that either. I don't want any of that. We just yeah. That's exactly what I'm trying to, we, we're thinking of, is making sure that when we do protest, that we have coordination with people. But the difficulty of that is, they get, if they're locking us up in level four, is how to deal with that. So we've got to come up with a strategy. So pray that we come up with a strategy that will work, because we do need, to, I think if they do do that, and keep us locked down, they're either going to do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, to control the election cycle, yeah. and the way that voting is done, yeah. or, or completely destroy the bloody economy. Yep. Oh, that's that's going to happen. Yeah. You're right, Pete. That's going to happen. They're going to. This is the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Or the best thing that they might do, and I've got to think this one through, is maybe delay it a few months. All right. But we. I've got to find out what the constitutional issue is with that. But the main thing is, guys, I need you, please, to support me in this initiative. This is the people's movement. It is the third option. I hate to say it, if you vote any of the other minor parties, you're going to waste your vote. Yeah. We're the only option yes. other than that. We're still talking to, to these to these people, and I, and I don't want to diminish or disrespect them, but the level of foolishness that I see from these people as they drive 120 miles an hour into a brick wall is just astounding to me. I can't get over it. Yeah. It, it confuses me about them. They seem almost smart, but... You know, because really, there's another way you can look at it like this, Fano. If they can't work out what situation we're in, and that we need to unite to, to protect our country, they're really not smart enough to be in Parliament, are they? Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a true way, I'm sorry to say. But we, there is nothing wrong with solidarity in Kotahi Tanga. So guys, please, if, you're on the, if you haven't enrolled to vote, please enroll to vote. If you're on the Māori seat, when it, when it comes to voting, on the ballot day, you will be voting for Billy Te Kahika in the Māori seat. If you want to give your party vote to anyone, give it to Advanced New Zealand or our local Advanced New Zealand candidate. Yeah. But for me, on the Māori seat, you vote for Billy Te Kahika. Not Advanced New Zealand, you vote me. That's my name on the, on the seat there, candidate for Te Tai All the way. And also, you give your party vote to Advanced New Zealand. My gut feeling is, is that we're going we're gonna to ramp past the 5%. Yeah. But we cannot and must not rely on, I think. That ain't going to cut it this time, Fano. Please get out there and vote. Spread the word about this. Our billboards go <coughs> up this week. My brother out at, at the back there, Paul, who came up with the uh, tackling Bloomfield idea, he's, he's part of the billboard team. And if you want to help us out with, with our billboards, please let us know. We've got, what's tomorrow? We've got two days to try and get out as many billboards as we can, so we're going to need your help and your love and support. Um, just before we say goodbye, I believe one of our fire wants to say a closing couple of remarks on behalf of uh, Mana Whenua. My name is Lily Chapman. I live down in Nova in the middle of part of the Kumara Patch. <coughs> Born and bred down here. I, I took a pop or two. Oh, look. But let's not tell a lie to everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry, we've had a heck of a day today, and uh, and um, we, we've got taunted at every corner, just like you. You've got taunted at every corner. But I'm so excited to uh, to be here tonight and to hear uh, everything that you, you you are standing for. Let me tell you, I've been, a, uh, I've been an old girl with the old pearls for a long time, <laughs> one party. But tonight, I'm, I'm with you because, you know, I, I am a Christian too, and I'm proud to be a Christian. And, um, and, and we Christians do uh, uh, funny things like we talk to God, okay? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we get a little bit cheeky every now and then, and, uh, and, uh, but we know our place. So I am excited um, that you'll be chosen, anointed and appointed, and, uh, as I would say. And uh, I wish you all the very best. To my niece over there, Mary, 
I'd like to uh, say, uh, um, introduce you to um, um, Ms. Uh, Mary Marsh. Mary is the uh, partner to my Mary uh, uh, and uh, they run Kiwi Kai. So, you know, I'll put a little plug in there for my niece's business. Uh, <laughs> and Kiwi Kai and Farm Bay. And also to my nephew, um, Jamie. Uh, Jamie Oliver, he, he, he comes from he hails from Rumwai. His dad and papa uh, hail from, from Rumwai and his, his family as well. So welcome here tonight. Thank you all for tuning up tonight. What a wonderful turnout. And we wish you all the best along the way. Yes. Our path is, is, is never an easy path. Yes. And um, be Christian or non-Christian, <coughs> nobody's path is easy. And yes. I come from a, a family of not only dairy farmers in the early days and kumara pickers, but I've also got a forestry background. And my fam my husband has been in the forestry for 50 years. I finally retired him. As you know, he started over here, up in, uh, up in Mangakahi here with uh, uh, BP Shell and NZDP. So all the forestry sea grown from here, all the way up to north to Patapiti, uh, down to Riverhead, uh, Woodhill, Maramurua, all those areas right down to Matakana Island. Well, I have to put my hand up and say, well, I had to deliver a lot of gear to those areas, and I'm happy I retired. Mm -hmm. So, and then now I have a family also that are in forestry. So we have a forestry background. And to my, my, my like when, when my nephew phoned my this baby and told me they were going to bring Billy here, I said, "Now be mindful. I live in a Redland County. <laughs> <laughs> we are the Labour National, or we are New Zealand First. But no mind how am I? Because we're all we're all uh, susceptible to change, and I think I think tonight you've changed a lot of us. Billy's got my vote. Billy has my vote for all these reasons, and being a nana and about to be a, a, a godmother for the first time. I strike one for the kingdom and for our children, for the future to come. And, um, and, and I have to say this, Billy, um, God bless Jacinda. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and for those that know no better, uh, because that's what we do. It's, it's, it's not the flesh and blood we fight, but it's the principalities we fight, and the evil people behind it, and they know no better. And I can't go first in her. So God bless her, because she knows no better. And, and, uh, and, and when she doesn't get it next, next, next turn, and you're the new Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you. 